Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. We're back on the Coolman SU2 cutter grinder today. We're finishing up the refurbishment of the work head, and we got to make some more tools, and we got lots of fun challenges in this one. So let's go. So if you're just joining us, we're working on refurbishing the work head on this D-bit grinder. And so these are the two remaining pieces. That's the indexing head, and this dovetail unit joins the upper and lower sections. So we'll start by dismantling this dovetail unit here. So there's the lead screw nut, which I'm considering remaking. I'm not sure what kind of condition it's in. We'll see how it is when it cleans up. So we'll just speed through all of this because it's pretty straightforward disassembly. One thing that's interesting is the thread on that feed is a 0.5 millimeter. I measured it because I was curious. It's really, really fine. So it takes forever to unthread it. And the last part to come off is this knob that runs the little tiny lead screw. And there's a pin in there. And uh, we need to know if that pin is straight or tapered. So I'm going to kind of clean the crud off. And uh, it's really important to know if it's tapered so that we pound it out the right direction. So I'm going to measure both ends. One side's 81 thou. The other side is also 81 thou. So this is a straight pin, so I take out a punch, and I can punch it out in either direction. And I got stopped because, of course, the smallest punch I have is 91 thousandths. Because, of course, it is. So by the magic of YouTube, I ordered a smaller punch, and that came in, and I was able to finish the job. And we can push that tiny little lead screw out of there. This is one of those parts that I just really love in this machine. Again, the thread on there is 0.5 millimeter, really, really tiny. And you really feel that when you're trying to unthread the, uh, the feed nut off of that guy. It takes forever to unscrew it. But the dovetails look like they're in really good shape, but the truth will come out after we evapor rust, clean, dry, and oil everything. And yeah, actually the dovetails look great. You can still see the original scraping on there, so no work to be done here. That's great news. And uh, that little tiny lead screw cleaned up really nice, and there's another look at that really fine thread. And I was debating whether to remake this uh, brass nut, but actually it's in really good shape. There's no backlash in it, so uh, I'm going to leave it as is. And now we just reassemble everything. The reverse of removal, tapping that pin back in is very satisfying. So I've been debating with myself what lubricants to use on which part of this machine. Anything that's exposed to the grinding grit, I don't want to put any kind of wet lubricant on, like grease or oil, because it'll collect that grit. Uh, but uh, these lead screws are well protected, and they didn't have grit on them before when I took it apart, really, so I think oil is okay here. Uh, anything that is exposed, I'm either leaving dry or using a dry lubricant, like a graphite. And here's that final dovetail assembly, and Boy, I'm really pleased with how that came out. Everything cleaned up really, really beautifully. And now is a big moment. We bring back the lower portion of the workhead, which we refurbished previously. We haven't seen it in a while, and it's time to assemble it. So I've got uh, the gibs here, and the gibs both also cleaned up really nice. They don't seem to need any work. So uh, again, using whey oil on those dovetails. And that slides together really, really nicely. And we reinstall that feed nut. And that nut was quite difficult to get aligned. Uh, it took a lot of tries to get that thing started. A really fine thread like that is very hard to start without cross-threading it. And uh, so it was very, very tricky. It took a lot of iteration to get that going. And now it's time to adjust the gibbs. So for that, we need a little tiny wrench. So why not this one from Eric at Hand Tool Rescue? He gave me this little guy at uh, the Go to the Land Fest where I met him. So thanks, Eric. And yeah, as cool as that is, the novelty of it wore off, and I went back to a proper 7mm wrench for the second one. And uh, it's a little bit hard to get the gibbs adjusted because the feed on this is so fine that it's kind of hard to tell uh, when it's right. But I basically just uh, tightened it and then backed them off a little bit, and it seems to move smoothly now. So now we can look at the really interesting part, which is the indexing head. So to start with, before I take it apart, I thought I'd see what the runout is in this guy because I was kind of curious. So uh, I'm getting about a thou and a half on this uh, end mill, which is kind of the highest precision half inch round thing I have. Now that collet was kind of beat up. It was one of the originals. So this is a Chinese replacement collet. And so it's new, but it's still getting about the same, a one and a half thou of run up. So we'll keep that in mind for later, but uh, now I got to figure out how to get this thing apart. And uh, the only fastener I can actually find on it are these two rings right here. And they're again, kind of pin spanner uh, style uh, nuts that are on there. So I don't know what size those pins are, so uh, I blew up this piece of drill rod and marked it for length. 
And what I'm gonna do is just turn this down little by little until it fits in those holes because I can't get anything else down in there to see how big they are. So I started by uh, facing this guy off. And then I set up for turning. And then I just come in here and turn this guy down a little at a time. And I'm deburring, of course, as I go along. And it's actually hard to measure, it's so small, but uh, in the end, I did get it to fit, and uh, it turns out to be two millimeters, which makes sense. Now the trick is, not only do I not have a pin wrench that size, but I don't have anything that'll fit down in between those two rings like that. There's no clearance, so I thought I'd try and make one. So I started by laying it out on some bar stock here to see if I could get this guy to go in there, and I got this far and decided I didn't like the way that was going, and I thought about a different design. So instead I went and grabbed some uh, quarter inch square bar and uh, cut two six inch chunks of it, and I squared up the ends. And uh, I love how machining can make the gaps between things disappear. I always think that's really cool. I then set out to drill holes for the pins, and of course I broke the end off a center drill, so I flipped those parts around and I just drilled it out from the back and pushed the tip of that broken drill out as I went. And uh, with the parts stacked like this, a piece of paper in there, make sure that they both get equal clamping force. And with this stacked up setup, I could just drill them both at once. So I drilled two holes one way and then two holes the other way at 90 degrees, and you'll see why in a second, and uh, reamed them both for uh, eighth inch. And then I come back in here with this big one inch end mill and uh, I'm cutting halfway through the material. So I'm creating a half lap joint here on one end with the two arms. And I do one pass on the Y axis just to square up the lap. And that surface came out great. I wasn't sure if it would because this mill was a hand-me-down and I wasn't sure if the edges on it were any good. And here you can see how this tool is going to work. I've got a pin temporarily in the end there and you can see how that's going to allow me to get down in there between those rings to access those uh, pin nuts. And uh, I do however have to uh, round off the corners because the uh, the quarter inch square stock is just a little too tight in there between those two radii. So just putting a little bit of a curve on there gives me the clearance I need to get in there. And uh, the next thing we need to do is put a bend in the ends because uh, coming out at a V like this, the, uh, the, the pins won't be square to the sides of the pin nuts. So I got out the uh, acetylene torch here and I'm just heating these guys up and I'm just bending them straight. And I'm just bending them straight by eye, that's sufficient. The pins just have to be basically uh, parallel when they go into the sides of the nut. And you can see how that's going to work now. And so then I made two of those pins and I also made a little hinge pin all out of that same drill rod. For the hinge pin I'm just uh, peening the ends over and then the action pins get uh, loctited in place. And that's my good old friend the Loctite 603. I really love that stuff. There's a link to buy some of that in the description. And here's the finished tool. I'm quite pleased with how that came out. One of the things I love about having a machine shop is that you can just make a tool like this anytime you need to. And this only took about an hour and was uh, a lot quicker than trying to source the exact right pin spanner online. Okay, moment of truth, does it actually work? Well, first of all, those pin nuts are very, very tight and uh, that thing is hard to hard on the hands, so I had to put a glove on. Still couldn't get it, so then I clamped the uh, the trim tab in the vise, and that allowed me to get the leverage I needed to break that guy loose. So finally that guy came out, and I'm happy to say that my little pin wrench thing worked really, really beautifully. So that tool is a keeper. And uh, so I thought that would now allow me to remove this outer ring, but that guy was also tight, and it has holes on the outside, clearly for a spanner, so I did have a wrench that would work on that. And uh, this right here was the moment where I realized I didn't have to make that fancy spanner. I thought those inner pin nuts were holding this whole assembly on. Turns out I didn't have to remove those first, so I could have used any old regular pin spanner. Oh well, making that tool was fun. Okay, so next I'm going to remove this knob because it seems to be in the way of taking anything else apart. So that pin just taps right out of there. And now it seems like it wants to come apart, but nothing is quite coming out all the way. But sometimes you just have to pry harder. So a little bit of leverage and 
that whole assembly comes off of the spindle like so. So that's looking really good. And here you can see the spring-loaded indexing pawl. And then there's the indexing ring itself. And there's a bushing in there. And that assembly just slides apart real nice. So next I need to get this trim ring off and it's got two flush screws. The first one loosened just fine. The second one was really, really tight and I could not get it, could not get it. So I tried hammering on the screwdriver and chowder, grr. So then I got out some leverage and that worked and out came that screw. But the trim ring won't come off because there's a key in the barrel of the spindle there. So I gotta get that key out. And uh, that key was really in there. The forceps wouldn't do it. And I tried getting it to move a little bit from the side. That didn't do it. I tried tapping the, on the side of it with the brass hammer. I tried prying it out with my scriber and I broke the end off my scriber, which is luckily replaceable. So then I busted out the heat and I tried to get some heat in there just a little bit. I didn't want to damage any of these uh, delicate parts. It didn't seem to help. I got some croil in there and let that soak in for a while. And I got the needle nose vice grips and that wasn't working. So at this point it was pretty clear that I was gonna have to get destructive to get this key out. So uh, I got a cold chisel out and I just hammered on the end of it and that cold chisel was enough to jar it loose. So I'd pretty much resigned myself to remaking this key, but uh, we'll see. I might be able to salvage it, maybe file it up and stone it and maybe I can recover, but if not, I'll make it again. And so that uh, trim ring comes off of there now. And it looks like that spindle now wants to come out of there, but this is an extremely high tolerance fit and uh, there's a little bit of a snag on that keyway and I don't want to drag it out of there. So I just deburred that guy a little bit. I don't want to risk damaging the bore. And uh, now that guy slides out beautifully. This is a very, very high precision part. It's really beautifully made. And you can see how there's an O-ring on the end. It keeps all of the grinding grit from getting in here anywhere. One of the nice things I've learned about this grinder is that uh, all of the mechanical parts all have O-rings around them, even this little knob here. If you can see, there's an O-ring right there that seals the uh, the pawl mechanism. So all the really important moving parts are all sealed with O-rings to keep the grinding dust out. Really cool. So next, uh, there's this uh, alignment kind of indexing pawl. This is used for uh, finding vertical when you're grinding something. And it should slide right out of there, but it's thoroughly seized in there. So. Uh, I thought maybe I can tap it out from the back, but that didn't seem to be working. It didn't seem like that hole goes all the way through. So yeah, I kind of gave up and got out the vice grips again and I was able to work it out. That piece is not in great condition and my chowdering with the vice grips didn't help either. The pawl itself is loose, so I may end up remaking this piece. We'll see if it cleans up. And so now all the ferrous parts go into the evapo rust, and then again a rinse and a dry and a clean and a light oiling. And some of the blind holes and such where I can't get in to clean the water out, I'm actually using WD-40 for its on-label purpose, displacing water, and it actually works great for that. And this uh, alignment pawl actually came out really, really nice. So I think if I just clean up the chowdering that I put on it with the vice grips, this part might be okay. And I absolutely love this uh, mode knob that uh, controls the indexing head. This thing came out so nice. The parts come out of the evapo rust looking so beautiful. Now for the bronze parts and the aluminum parts, I just uh, clean things up with uh, Scotch-Brite and WD-40 and uh, a little bit of elbow grease. And I'm also using one-to-one uh, -one simple green there for a lot of the cleaning. And those parts are coming out very nice as well. There's some staining on there that won't ever come off, but uh, that's okay. Now this is cool. You can see that the uh, bore for the spindle has a crosshatch pattern in it, like the cylinder in an engine. So I think that's actually been honed. So back to our friend the mangled key, I decided to take a shot at saving it. So I spent some quality time with files and uh, emery paper and uh, it actually came out really good. You can see uh, one nick in the end there where I hit it with the cold chisel, but uh, otherwise that key I think is salvageable. And then some more filing and emery cloth saved that pawl as well. That thing actually came out really nice. and. After being cleaned up, the sliding fit in there is perfect. Now the pawl was still loose on the end of the shaft and that guy was just peened on. So I just had to re-peen it basically and tighten it up. And that thing was good as new. And once again, I'm using whey oil on uh, the moving parts that are all sealed away from the grinding dust. And now we can slide the spindle back in the bore there. And gosh, I wish you could feel the quality of this fit. It's really, really amazing. Oh, it's just, it's so beautiful. So after all that cleaning, I wanted to check the run out again and look at that. 
there's maybe a couple of tenths on that. That's really, really amazing. Okay, well, some uh, light oil on the machine surfaces, and we can start reassembly. The aluminum trim ring goes back on there, and that screw has a little bit of a burr on it where I chowdered it up, so I took that to the emery cloth and uh, smoothed it out, and uh, now that's all good. That uh, trim ring has moving parts that slide over it, so I didn't want the burr on that screw to mess things up. And my repaired key goes back in there really nicely. That actually turned out great. And here's that pawl mechanism, which was also in pretty rough shape. And you can see how the middle has been rough turned and then the end has been precision ground because the end there has the O-ring around it. So it's got to have a good surface there to seal properly. So that uh, spring-loaded pawl goes back in there, just like that. And then this bronze bushing goes back on the outside. And again, this is a really incredible fit. And here's the indexing ring, and this guy's actually cast iron, which is pretty interesting. And then this outer ring goes on there, and now we can put our pin nuts back on. And much like the other components, uh, the pin nuts set the uh, end play on this guy, so a little bit of uh, fiddling back and forth with that guy to uh, get that tension just right. And then for retightening this guy, you really need two sets of pin wrenches, and of course I only made one, so uh, I kind of cheated and I used a punch to hold the lower ring because the lower ring doesn't have really a lot of force on it when you're doing that. So a little bit of fiddling with that and that turns just absolutely beautiful and there's zero end play in it. So really, really happy with how this turned out. And so now we can reinstall that control knob that sets the mode of the indexing head. And last but not least, the outer ring goes on the outside, and we just tighten that up with my spanner. And a quick test run of all the different modes on the indexing head. There's the 180 degree indexing mode, and then the locked mode, and then you can lock it at various small increments with that lock. It's all working really, really well. Okay, let's check run out again. So once again, here we are on the outermost part of the spindle and we've got a couple of tenths there, really, really nice. But the run out on an end mill mounted in there is still about a thousandth. So we made it a little better with the cleaning, but uh, it's still a little higher than I would like. So I tried measuring on the collet itself and the collet is about a thou out as well. So the run out seems to be coming from the collet. So measuring on the tapered portion of the spindle where the collet sits and amazingly, that's even less than the outside, like there's, maybe a tenth of run out on that taper. But measuring down in the straight part of the barrel, and there's the thou and a half of run out right there. So that's where the run out seems to be coming from. It seems like maybe the collets aren't seating properly. So maybe I just need to buy better collets or something. I'm not sure. Uh, let me know in the comments if you think a thou of run out in those collets is too much for this machine, uh, or if it's fine. I'm uh, honestly really not sure. I don't have a lot of experience with uh, with these machines. Okay, so now we can reunite the indexing head with the rest of the work head. And once again, some whey oil on there. And now we need to adjust the gibs and uh, adjusting the gibs on uh, this guy is quite a bit easier because uh, this guy has uh, two modes. There's a coarse adjustment and a fine adjustment. This knob right here is the fine adjustment. If you loosen this set screw, then you get a, a, a kind of a, a rapid feed so that you can use that to check the tightness of the gibs. And then when that guy is tight, then the thumb wheel is engaged and acts as your fine feet. So that's a really cool mechanism. So here's the entire work head, uh, completely refurbished and back together. Looks really nice. I'm very, very pleased with how this is going so far. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. Pew, pew, pew. I hope you enjoy this process and we will see you next time.